Hi everyone, I'm excited today because we are introducing a new global community series, Boots on the Ground, which are real life citizens like you and like me that have lived through different currency crisis. We need to know this so that we have an idea of what lies ahead and what we can do and what we need to do to get ready for this and not just live through it, but I don't know, maybe even thrive through it. You know, a lot of you are here because you want to understand this information because if you believe like I do that a reset is is coming our way, then you want to be prepared. Of course, there are others of you that may be looking at this and saying, that cannot possibly happen here, wherever here is. So today, we're going to interview Yaniv, boots on the ground, who actually lived through the Israeli hyperinflation, coming up next. And you can see on this slide that Israel's hyperinflation was, you know, was imminent because first of all, their currency was never backed by gold. So it was always a pure fiat money, which is a government based money. So they lived with inflation forever. That's why in order to get people to trust it, all contracts were indexed. That means employment contracts, purchase contracts, you know, insurance, stocks, all of that. Everything was indexed to inflation. People got used to it. They got comfortable with it until it started to run away and go into hyperinflation. After which point, then actually the indexation broke down. Confidence was lost because salaries never keep pace with inflation by design. And then you had the final hyperinflationary bout. Welcome, Yaniv. I'm so happy to have you here today. And I know you're coming to us from Israel. So even with the time change, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank yes. you for having me. Well, I think this is so important to our whole community. And I wanted to start by asking you some questions that I think our viewers are really interested in, like, uh, do you remember, I know you were young during the crash or uh, during the hyperinflation, but do you remember what happened right before that? Can you kind of tell us a bit about your experience? Well, I, what I remember is, as I said, I was very young, so many of the, I was shielded from many of the effects of the hyperinflation. Uh, but it, what I remember is watching... Um, Tent, a tent city near my house because people lost their home and I was rem remember very feeling very lucky that we didn't lose our house um, I didn't know that we did lose uh, uh, our, our house <laughs> we were we were able to rent we were able to, to live indoors but but it was a very difficult time for my family as well um, I also remember changing uh, the currency a lot. And I also remember being a millionaire at the age of five or six because I got some money. It was a million shekels. It was able to buy me not a lot. I remember buying um, a rubber ball or something like that, but uh, not not a lot. Uh, but uh, it was a very difficult time. I, can, I, I think I can say that that we were traumatized by that period of time. People remember these times very well. When you ask someone who's older than I am, uh, how was it during these times, they all remember it as a very, very difficult, very, very difficult time. So at what point, you know, right after, on that confidence piece, I and mean, we know that a fiat money, a government-based money that's based upon inflation, demands the confidence of the population. Can you remember how that piece might have unfolded? I can tell you that, um, as, as you know, I, I watch your, your videos and I was also very intrigued about hyperinflation. And I remember the hyperinflation and I went back to, 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 to old newspapers and asked my, my people that I know and I tried to gather information about 
uh, these times, and I can I I got a picture from uh, from from what I what I went through. So I can tell you a few things about it. Um, I can tell you that it started with rumors about how the shekel is going to lose a lot of its value, and very quickly the rumors became reality. Um, actually, um, there was. It's not the, the, the people lost their faith in the currency um, due to many things. And one of them was war. It wasn't a very good time. It was also after two years of very, um, a very, uh, a boom in the economy. Um, I don't think that you, I don't know if you know that, but in 1977 there was a new government that replaced the old party that uh, that was in charge was ruling Israel from its actually the beginning 1948 and one of the things that they did was open up uh, lower the tariffs and uh, and uh, making things very easy uh, uh, to, to buy foreign goods and uh, people started borrowing and spending and uh, everybody talked about it as a miracle and uh, this miracle had a very high price in there. That in '82, for example, 1982 and 1981, they bought cars. I think it, uh, they purchased 150 percent more cars than in the previous years. And uh, a colored television was very popular then. Uh, and people bought, and people took out loans. Mm -hmm. Another thing that happened in the late '70s. What that was that the banks were allowed to buy their own shares. In the late 70s, we, we, we were around between 20 and 40 percent inflation a year, which is very high. Yes. Uh, not as, as, it, as it was late in later years, but it was very high. And people were afraid that the government and the banks were afraid that people would take the money and take the money from the bank. So what they did was. They told you can buy the shares of the banks, and they always go up. And not only do they go up, they go up over inflation. inflation. Gosh, that sounds years. familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is what, what happened, and it worked for five years. It worked. But as the financial uh, situation uh, became worse, and uh, as I said, there was a war going on, and people, uh, it was more difficult, people started to... Uh, sell their shares and, and trying to buy foreign currency such as the dollar and they started to sell the shares but the banks had to buy these shares and they had to buy more and more shares <laughs> at the time but they couldn't buy any more shares and they went to the, to the government and the government on a, uh, Thursday which is the last day announced that it was the Black Thursday uh, October 6, 1983, and they announced that on Sunday the stock market will be closed, and they closed it for about two weeks. Uh, and they, used the the government and the banks together, thought what they can do. But I can tell you that in Israel it was a very uh, scary time. I can tell you that people were really afraid. They couldn't sell their shares, they couldn't do anything in the stock market, uh, and the um, shekel lost a lot of its value very, very fast. You tell it lost almost 30% in, in three days. Actually, yeah. uh, trade in foreign currencies that was opened on the Monday, the following Monday, the next day, uh, they closed it at 11 a.m. because they they saw that it's not going to be very very good for the for the shekel. So they run away from the shekel. They try to to liquidate whatever they have. Uh, I also saw that uh, people went to buy um, produce to buy groceries. Well, yeah, them. I was going to ask you that because we know that during this period, food becomes the biggest challenge. For most people, so uh, yes, please talk about I, that. But uh, I, 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 you need to to keep in mind that Israel, especially then, was a very centralized country. Mm -hmm. Our milk, our dairy products, our bread, agriculture, mm -hmm. very centralized. 
so I, I didn't see evidence of, of, of the shortage in shortage in food, shortage in money to buy food that I saw. But in the beginning, there was a shortage of food. I, I saw reports that that uh, people came and cleaned up the supermarkets, and there was nothing to buy. And at least in the first uh, few days, so people were panicking. They actually, right. I. Saw I saw a report that it, they didn't see anything like it since the war in 1973. And the war in 1973 was a very bad. All wars bad, but oh, were bad. Oh, man. Especially bad war. And we were very close to losing this war. And so you can see how much people were afraid. People were as afraid as a very, very difficult war and very, very scary war. And mm -hmm. they went to the supermarket and cleaned them out. And people had difficulty in actually making any transaction because people didn't know what things will cost the next day, even the merchants, the people who sold uh, uh, things, they, they didn't know how to value uh, the, the commodity, they didn't know how, what was uh, its real fair price. I remember my father telling me that you got your paycheck and you ran to spend it because you mm -hmm. knew that it would lose a lot of its value very, very fast. As the stock market started functioning again, the government bought all the stock of the banks that were sold. And in order to do that, they printed money. And they printed a lot of money. And this was, I think, the main reason for the hyperinflation yes. later on. That was, uh, I think it was 450%. And this is only the reported number. The, maybe it was even more. Exactly. Uh, so uh, they printed a lot of money and they bought the shares. And they had to buy more and more shares. And naturally, every day they said that they don't have to buy a lot of shares. Things are turning. Uh, uh, things are changing. Things are, will get better. You can see it all the time. Uh, but you can see that the, that the people are struggling. People, it's 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 a horrible thing to to go, to go through. I can, I can tell you, it's a horrible thing. To Yes, but we're seeing the same kind of thing in the stock market now with all the share buybacks and all the government intervention to keep things boosted up so that people keep their wealth inside of the system. And then... Yes, and I, I can tell you that, that back then they actually didn't allow people to hold dollars, for example. Uh, they had to uh, give the banks whatever dollars they held. They could only buy dollars if they were going abroad, and they had to present the plane ticket, and they had to get it. It was written in the passport that they took dollars, and it was only $500. Uh, and, uh, and they really tried to control it. They also uh, allowed people to, to peg their investment to the dollar, uh, at some point, they, because there was so uh, dollars were running out, there was there were no dollars, and the banks came out and said, "Do something because we can't continue like that." Uh, but uh, of course, they taxed that uh, that it's not a profit, but they, they, but they taxed it. And whenever you went to to even the five hundred dollars that you were allowed to get from the bank, that was taxed as well. Very very. I mean, they, when they can, when they control their own money, they they can do a lot of things. There. Anything that kind of sounds a lot. Well, actually, that sounds exactly like the plan that they have in place for cash right now on a global basis. Where if you're going to take out, and we're already hearing some of this starting to manifest, uh, where if you're going to take out cash or you're going to deposit cash, you're going to pay a fee to do it. Because yeah, they don't that, want you to hold cash. Same reason why they didn't want you to hold dollars back then. Yeah, so so on top of the bank commissions, you only, I think it was 15%. It was a lot. You, you just want to take your money from the bank. I mean, it's not like... Exactly. Long, your money that you want to, you want to take. Well, and, and that's because it's only the perception that it's your money. It's really huh. their money. and um, And they say that. Uh, on anything, and even when they changed um, the money market laws, we want to make sure that these fees are visible enough, and that's what they intend to do by going zero uh, to below zero um, in interest. They want it big enough, the fee big enough 
that you go, oh, well, maybe I don't want to take it. And so you risk your principal to avoid yeah. that little fee. What happened to the principal? They revalued officially a thousand to one. And then it kept going down after that as well. Yes, it went down. And um, the, the tax rates went very, very, very high. Whatever they could tax, they did. Um, if you went, uh, if you wanted to buy a plane ticket, there was a very high tax uh, just for for leaving the country, just for flying to, to some other country. Um, um, taxes were very, very high, um, and and actually, what you what you got was was a lot less than what you were used to do. And people were, were fired. A lot of people were fired. Crime went up, I think, fifty percent. Uh, people also had a lot of money in their apartment because people didn't trust the banks, and so people, so the, uh, there was a lot more uh, money to take if you were breaking into an apartment. Probably under the mattress, you could have found money there. Uh, there was a joke of, uh, of, uh, of keeping dollars under the floor tiles. Uh, people, people resorted to that because their money in the bank wasn't safe. Not shekels and not even dollars. So as you can see, and this just verifies what Yaniv was saying about it, that as the inflation exploded, so did the stock market and the banks were buying their own shares, etc. And in fact, the stock market went up 6,500 times during this hyperinflationary event, which you go, well, yay, that's awesome. Except that at the same time, they reset the currency a thousand to one, and of course, that wasn't, you know, the end of it. It continued to go down afterwards. And when they did that reset of the currency, there's the new Israeli shekel. The design was exactly the same. We were just talking about this as the old shekel. That's how they lock you into staying in the system and thinking that everything is okay. They keep things as normal as possible. So one shekel to the other. So how long after they did the reset um, a thousand to one, then it dropped further. But but how long until it started to improve? Do you remember? Uh, it started to improve around 1985. There was a new government. Of course, the government fell. There was a new government, and um, they had it. As I said, it was, it was a different time because everything was very centralized. So the government. Uh, sat down with the workers' unions, which were very, very strong there today. Many people, I think the unions are very small percent of the workers here, but but then they were very, very uh, important. And mm -hmm. I think most workers were unionized and they sat with them. Uh, and, uh, and, and it was very painful because they cut back on a lot of government spending. And, uh, and the hospitals didn't have the equipment, and uh, everything became more expensive, and and uh, and it, it started to stabilize 1986, 1987. And still, we had a high inflation, but not like that. Not so, like that. So that's interesting that you said that because when you look at the uh, charts and the graphs, um, really it looks like boy, inflation was just over which is not really the truth when you're on the ground living through it. Um, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how they rigged the numbers then, because uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite obvious, but uh, right. I don't know then. I think things did improve, as I said, because they could decide that there were wants not to raise prices and they enforced them very, very heavily. People were, merchants were told, don't raise your price, and that's what they did. Many of the, of the, um, of, of the things that were bought, mainly of the basic goods, like food, and, and they were regulated by the government. The government set the price for it. So they were able to control a lot more than they do today. That's why I think it, they were able to go over it quite quickly, although we continue to suffer from, uh, from high inflation in, in later years. Well, I'm kind of curious if you can remember something that you used to buy when you were back then, 
um, after they revalued the shekel, and if you still buy it today, has it maintained its cost or has it gone up in terms of, of the shekel? I can only, uh, I, I don't know to which, they changed the currency three times between 1980 and 1985. Three As times? Person, that seems to yeah. be the global average. <laughs> yeah. Uh, seriously, so, uh, it's so it interesting. From, it went from the lira to a shekel, and then, right. and then uh, at first the shekel was worth, uh, 3.9 shekels were worth about a dollar. And by the time the hyperinflation ended, it was around 150 shekels to a dollar. And then part of the plan was to reevaluate, to change the currency again, and 1,000 shekels became one shekel. But and the yeah. interesting thing about that was the design of the paper money was exactly the same, just yeah. less those three zeros so that people did not know psychologically. Well, that psychologically. I can tell you that we you got the, 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 we had a coin for one shekel. It was a new coin, and we called it a cockroach because it was very very small, but it was very valuable because uh, the one thousand shekels, which had their own note for it, suddenly became a very 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 small uh, coin, and it got lost. And it was very easy to lose it. I remember as a, as a kid, it was it, it was valuable because they turned it uh, and and and. Actually, psychologically, probably it worked because it had value. The shekel had value again because uh, such a small coin had purchasing power of a thousand shekels. Maybe, Do you maybe... remember what you bought with that one shekel? Do you remember anything that you bought with that one shekel then? I can tell you what I bought with this one shekel. Exactly. But uh, in popsicles. Okay. So what would a popsicle yeah. cost you today yeah. in shekels? Buy, you could buy... Um, um, you could buy two ice popsicles for one ship. Two. And today? Today you would buy one for five or six ships. One popsicle. Okay. So <laughs> it really never, you know, that's just a psychological thing to stay inside of the fiat money system. That's one way that they hide it. You know, I mean, that's why I say that when we go into this next currency, my bet is it's still going to be called the dollar, just like it was every single time. And, you know, I mean, I've done enough studies on this is that's how they do that, because they know that people marry the legal money of the state. And it's I, I don't know why. So please, you will have a better perspective on this than I do. But. You know, they marry the legal money of the state, so it's hard for them to imagine that it went away. So you went from an old shekel revalued a thousand times to one new shekel. The design was exactly the same as the old shekel, and people accepted it. Yeah, people accept many things, I can tell you. <laughs> people get used to things. People, you know, people got used to... I started this whole this whole subject interests me because I can tell you that housing prices in Israel went up maybe two to three hundred percent in the last nine eight nine years. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you the people got used to it today. I mean, when you say that uh, uh, a nine hundred uh, square foot apartment in Tel Aviv can buy you an apartment in Manhattan, it seems logical to people. Well, it's not logical me right uh, uh, it makes no sense to me because I remember what real estate costs and I remember and I know that it, it makes no sense but people get used to it very very fast and it always amazes me how people accept it and this is what people do and probably this is why it's working again and again uh, you know common to me it's common sense but I think that common sense is very uncommon it is. I'm really hoping that what we end up having, because this will be, I, I'm, I'm convinced, of course, this is my opinion, and we're going to know whether or not this is accurate, but this is a global occurrence, and so we're looking at a global reset. So unlike when it's just one place or another place or another place, 
we might be able to have affect a change into a more fair system because as you've experienced when they change from the old shekel to the new shekel what did they really change yeah of course and and this time I, I, it seems unlikely that people will have somewhere to escape because at least israelis had the dollar they could go and buy dollars and they the dollars kept their value and if it will happen globally, then who knows? Right. They, they actually, what, what's interesting about that statement is they kept their value versus the shekel because the shekel was losing so much value so rapidly. But that was also the period of time when uh, the U.S. dollar was in jeopardy of losing its status as the world reserve currency and Kissinger engineered the petrodollar to maintain that. But the dollar was actually losing value during that period of time because we were in transition to a brand new, fully debt-based system. You guys were already on that kind of system. You were already pure fiat. But, but you know, that, that, uh, it's still, it was still a better house in the neighborhood, in a bad neighborhood. Right. Because people had shekels and they had to do something with it. And they right. didn't care. They had to, to put it somewhere because tomorrow it was... I remember my mother told me that we sold our apartment and, and she discovered, I don't know if it's true, but she said a week later, the money was 25% less. That's and probably so true. People, so, so, so people... Well, how did gold and silver fit in there? Because, you know, you guys were never on the gold standard and yeah. a, a lot of the people immigrated to Israel from way worse circumstances than they were even dealing with. Of course. Um, well, I can tell you that the, the gold kept its value because um, people who had gold, they retained their purchasing power. Exactly. I don't, so, uh, because the, 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 the price of gold was, I think it's about 300 or 400 dollars at the time, and this was the price. You had an ounce of gold, so you could sell it for, for, for that price. Um, I, but but uh, it was more it was easier to go to the dollar to uh, change it was the black market of the dollar of course you couldn't, you couldn't buy it legally and, uh, and and people bought dollars but uh, gold kept its value of course yeah unfortunately today since this is a global issue there's really not going to be any stable fiat currency because the debt levels are so high the whole system has to reset into a new system. So, so what, okay, I'm not gonna ask that question because that's too personal. Um, but if, if that's the, indeed the case, that there really is no other fiat currency to go to, then it might make sense to do some good money, gold, silver, physical, in your possession. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, look, I, I always think that you should diversify. You should you should be in as many uh, forms of currency or, or purchasing power as, as you can because you never know what's going on, what's going to happen. And and I do agree with you that today it's a very different situation because Israel was in a problem, but there were other currencies that didn't suffer as much as we did, and people could do uh, easier things and. Uh, and by dollars and they were okay although uh, the government did make it a lot more difficult to, to keep dollars and all dollars and buy dollars but they had at least the dollar mm -hmm. in a situation where the dollars itself would lose value then it's a, I, I, we've never been there before I'm, uh, I'm scared to think what will happen <laughs> it's just the speed right it, it, it's always like you had said initially it starts out really slow and so people didn't really notice it, and then they get used to it, and it's the same thing with the value of the dollar. I mean, I think we've I lost 88% uh, since that period of time to today. Well, I can tell you, uh, which reminds me that uh, you uh, you have videos about what the insiders are doing. Yeah. But I can tell you that they sold the shares of the banks weeks before um, the, the stock market market was closed. There was an investigation. So the bank didn't cooperate with, the, with that investigation. Uh, the people who knew what's going to happen, I assume, made a lot of money. 
during oh, the yeah. they, exactly. Uh, I'm sure that they, if you if you could prepare for that, then you could do, you could make a lot of money. And uh, actually, I saw it. Uh, and I saw it. One of the articles published at those times that the the, the, the people who suffered the most were the regular people, the, the top ten ten percent or five percent. They were okay, uh, mm -hmm. but the regular people really really suffered. Uh, especially people with debt. Another thing that you see, Huge. debt will bear hyperinflation. The one thing that I can say, don't be in debt during hyperinflation because you can't control it. You lose control. You exactly. earn less, and the debt grows high, and, and, and you can't contain it. Uh, it's, it's horrible. Another thing you should probably uh, be aware of that. At least try not to get into debt during hyperinflation. So oh, don't, don't, right. don't have, but try not try to have enough so that if uh, there will be a hyperinflationary event, then you will be able to live from what you have. Because a lot of people had to take out debt because they couldn't buy food because they had to support their family. You know, they lost their jobs or their wages were actually. Uh, worth a lot less, and, and they took out loans, and these loans were horrible. I and mean, if you had a loan, it's the worst thing that can happen. I think it's, it's, it's horrible. Well, see, that's also where gold comes into play, because like you mentioned before, that, you know, that um, gold during this period of time holds your purchasing power. So if you have variable rate debt, you're right, you're dead. I mean, there's just no way you will ever get out of that. If you have fixed rate debt and it's balanced with the gold, since that's actually how a reset is conducted, then it's easy to pay that off. That's why those top, you know, five and 10% did okay and actually were probably able to expand their wealth while the rest of the individuals were really suffering. During high inflation, I'm not even talking about hyperinflation, but in high inflation, you can't get fixed rates uh, right. loans. Everything, everything, even the credit cards, uh, central oh. bill, uh, because you can't take it. And even today, today you can take fixed rate mortgages, for example, but people don't do that because uh, <laughs> no, they don't do that. Many of them... It's, it's it's called nudging. Do this because this is what we want you to do. So they'll make those variable rates more attractive. But it's a trap. It's all a trap, yeah. really. Easy low, easy credit. And prices went up so much so that, that the fixed rate is more, more expensive loan than, than other loans. Than At the people moment. Don't, people don't have the money to can't afford the fixed rate, which is absurd because... It's a lot more dangerous to take a variable uh, uh, rate, uh, but they but they do it anyway. Exactly. I personally don't. Well, well yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> yeah, but what would you say is like the most important thing that you want our viewers to understand about this whole experience? A few things. You never know how worse it's gonna get. You probably don't have a lot of time to get your affairs in order beforehand. Uh, if if you're not someone who's in the know, it will surprise you. The timing will surprise you. And um, and and the most important thing: don't be in debt. Don't be in debt. Uh, have enough money. Set aside to to keep your family uh, and uh, and I advise not a lot of fiat currency, especially not in the bank. Uh, <laughs> We're because you have no, you have no control. Well, yeah, well, that's actually the most true statement on any of the fiat products. So in the stock markets, the bond, all these ETFs, all these fancy exotic complex, you know, derivatives and all of that, if it's inside of the system, it's like a black box. 
and you have no control. It, if you think you do, it's just about perception management, but not reality. And I probably should have asked you this right off the bat, but I kind of want to close with this because, you know, you're coming to us from Israel. We have a nice time difference between us, and I really appreciate you doing this. Why, would, why did you really want to do this today and share this with everybody? First of all, I, I, I'm very thankful for what you're doing, for your videos. And uh, I learned from them. And um, I, 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 it started with an e email that I wrote you, just if you want to know how things look like during IP inflation, maybe you'd like to take a look because it's very in interesting how the markets, how, 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 what's going on during hyperinflation. It was close to home for me, and I was able to go back and read uh, newspapers in Hebrew, which are not probably not your language. No. So I could really uh, look at how things look like back then. Uh, so I felt um, I wanted to to give you at least one my point of view and what we saw from Israel, um, and uh, maybe someone will find it helpful. And uh, and another thing is is that. People, I think people need to realize that this situation in which we're in right now is global, and they need to realize how global it is. It's not just Canada and Australia and all those big countries. Exactly. Israel, in our little corner of the world, we experienced the same thing, uh, the drop in interest rates in 2008, 2009, what it did to everything. Uh, um, uh, actually, uh, how the currency loses value today because maybe the prices of real estate went up uh, 200 percent but you could might as well say the currency was half or a quarter of what it did and uh, and I and I can see that a lot of people here also don't realize it. they they really get very fast to how things are right now and they think that what is going on right now should go on forever uh, even people remember things uh, that they simply, it's very difficult to, to uh, convince people and tell them there may be another way to look at, at uh, these phenomena. Uh, but I experience also, I, I talk to my friends and I see a lot of my friends taking very, very high mortgages and, uh, and to buy tiny apartments and not the best places and I can see them. And, and not not in fixed rates and variable rates, and I can see them really putting their families in jeopardy. And I can see that it, I personally cannot convince. I didn't convince many people, a few people, but but most people uh, simply go on uh, doing what they're doing. So, um, what would you say to those people that just find it impossible be to believe that it could happen here, where, wherever here is? What would you say to them? I would say that it's normal because people don't see it coming. People don't think that tomorrow their currency will be worth 30% less. And uh, it's, it's, it's like a war. I, mean, I, I said at the beginning that uh, mm -hmm. if you remember the war, it's like a war. It's something that, that uh, really comes in and usually it surprises you and it, it changes your life. And, and Lives were lost. People committed suicide. There were songs about it, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and people, many lives were changed. Most of them for the worst because uh, people were not prepared. And uh, you should you should be prepared. Oh boy, I agree. Food, water, energy, security barterability, wealth preservation, and community. That's the best way for all of us to be prepared for what we're going to be dealing with. Yep, the stock markets are making new highs. whoop de doo it's all engineered, it's all manufactured, so that that's where you keep your wealth. So when we hit a globe, I mean, you know, we can see hot spots of hyperinflation that are just erupting all over the world now coming to a theater near you, be yeah, ready. Sure. What's going on there is very alarming. 
Look, every country, it's, it's a bit of a different story. Turkey with the tariffs and Iran with whatever is going on in Iran. And, but it's, all, it's, it's a little bit different, but it's the same. And right. when it happens, it's the same. And when your currency loses its value, it doesn't matter why. It simply happens and you need to be ready for it. And if you're not, then you're in trouble. Exactly. And since this is global, since there is no other currency to run to, then it makes it that much more important to run to real money, physical gold, physical silver. It's universal. I could travel with it. I could put it on my body in the form of jewelry if I needed to. I could put it in my pocket as a collection. I can utilize it because a hundred percent of the time you can always convert physical gold into and silver into any currency any good or any service as you've experienced you cannot always convert a currency into goods services or other currencies thank you so much is there anything else that you would like to say before we sign off today I'd just like to thank you for uh, your video, which I watch frequently. Thank you so uh, much. And um, I think you're, very, you're doing a very important work. And uh, I want to thank you. Well, I want to thank you for coming on and being our inaugural, inaugural guest on our Boots on the Ground so we can help people get prepared. Personally, I'm getting goosebumps. I know that I was groomed for this moment in time, so I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do, but it makes it a whole lot better with you participating. So I really can't thank you enough. Thank you. And you be safe and maybe we'll talk again. Yeah, uh, I'd like that. Okay. Take Bye. care. And everybody out there, please prepare food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, these two things you can do with gold and silver. And don't forget to build a community. That's what we're doing here globally. This is our global community. And, and I'm really proud. I'm really proud of what we're doing here. So please take care. Until the next time, bye-bye.